All right, we just built a new fucking crazy ridge line on the crazy ridge line. Ah! Spiky back. Holy shit, right, we're in. Oh my God. That was fucking mental. Oh. Woo. Kinematics. I really like the single pivot design. First reason, this bike has very linear leverage ratio. It's got about 8% progression in the setup. Why linear? If you have a really progressive bike, it's nice and soft at the start of the travel, but it really ramps up at the end and it's hard to use all of the travel. And a lot of the time you sort of sat in that mid stroke, you're not getting the mid stroke support that you want when you want to push into corners or you want to keep that rear wheel stuck to the ground. Think of a badly performing air fork. You're sitting in the middle of the travel, it's really soft, you've got nothing to push against, and then you can't use all of the travel. Everyone knows a coil fork feels the best because it's linear. Every mountain bike company for years has been trying to make their front suspension fork more linear because it feels like a coil, the coil-like feel. This bike's coil front and rear. It's got a similar leverage ratio front and rear, essentially. That gives you really good mid-stroke support, really good response, really easy to push against, really stable from the sag point and into the mid-stroke. But people think that then you'll bottom out really easy. This is untrue in my testing. We tested with rules from a few years ago on the common sal. We had two different links, the standard link, which had about 40% progression and my custom link, which had 20% progression. So half as much progression. As soon as I put the more linear link on, it was a lot easier to ride, more mid-stroke support, the bike sitting up in the travel, sitting up through the corners better. It's easier to ride, more responsive. It's also a lot easier when you're doing Big impacts, big drops, jumps to the flat. It's really easy to feel what it's going to do. You just get a nice compression and rebound. There's no big spike at the end. And we did actually test this on um, a drop off, a two meter drop to flat. And we had two shocks set up and rules going to calculate damping forces to be equal on each shock with the different linkages. And the more linear bike actually used less travel overall on the drop and on some other big impacts that we measured. It also, the force going through the frame into the rider measured by the accelerometer on the frame, an average of five Gs going into the rider with a progressive bike, blown through the first part of the travel and you get a big spike at the end where it's trying to absorb all the force. Whereas a linear bike only gave one G, so one fifth of the force going into the rider. And that's because all the way through the travel, it's slowly absorbing more force through the stroke and you don't get a big spike at the end. And that's why it's really predictable when you do a big drop to flat, it absorbs the impact better. It also uses less travel. So then you can also run the bike softer with more sag, which gives you more grip, more bump absorption, and you still don't bottom out. It's fantastic. A lot of people think you bottom out too easily on a single pivot. They've been using a standard shock and most shocks just don't have enough damping force needed to slow the suspension down in those situations and using the progression in my opinion is like a band-aid to to help this whereas really more linear with more damping force is the key to a, a bike that's going to give you sensitivity mid-stroke support and bottom out support the other important kinematic is the anti-rise which is how much the brake squats or lifts up under braking a lot of people think having a high anti-rise number locks out the suspension in my opinion, it helps the suspension squat into the travel. So when you're traveling down a hill and you're braking hard, the bike will actually squat more into the rear of the travel. It'll keep the mainframe, the chassis more stable. Then you're not pitching forwards like you do on a bike with low anti-rise. And then your weight's going forward. Then you're having to lean back. Then you're fighting the bike pitching forwards. If you pitch too far forwards, you don't have any weight on the rear wheel. And even though it might be more active on paper, there's no weight on the rear wheel, so you can't brake and you can't get the rear wheel to grip and it'll start to skid and slide. 
So this does get a little bit sort of harsher under braking, but as I said, keeps the chassis more stable. You can stay in a more central position, easier to brake. You can brake harder, which means you can brake less, which means you're not braking and hindering the suspension moving so much. And also with a steel construction and the good damping suspension setup and also running quite soft spoke tensions, a lot of those factors can offset this harshness from the suspension. If you've got a really hard, stiff bike, you can feel that harshness more, but on this bike, it really absorbs a lot of that in other ways anyway. So under braking, excellent grip, excellent braking characteristics, really easy to brake hard and late into corners. The other one is the anti-squat. This is about 100% anti-squat using the idler wheel, but it's also, there's no pedal kickback or tension on the chain when you're hitting bumps. So this gives the suspension really free action to move up and down and it's not being hindered by the chain. A lot of people nowadays using O-chains, which are a great device for bikes with a lot of pedal kickback. This bike doesn't need it. It's really smooth and there's no hindrance from the chain anyway. It does bob a little bit under pedaling due to the setup, but I don't think that's really important. This kind of bike, I'm normally getting a lift to the top or riding it for one hour, one hour and a half tarmac or fire road to get to the top and in that case just use the lockout switch on the suspension and just fly to the top like you were on the hardtail. Originally we did have a extra piece of steel which fitted on here which allowed us to move the idler wheel to give it more anti-squat which should in theory give it better pedaling characteristics but I came to the conclusion myself and also Nico from Edgery that even though it pedals better on paper in reality it's worse because the tension created between the chain ring and the idler wheel to give you that anti-squat means there's a lot of tension between these two points and that extra force pulling on the chain and also pulling on the chain from the idler to the rear sprocket puts a lot of tension on the chain and then the chain is less free to rotate and that actually gives you more friction and loses efficiency so we both found that on paper it's worse but in reality it's a lot better climbing and also with no tension on the chain when you are climbing and there's little bumps on the trail it tracks the ground a lot better and you're not getting hung up on the bumps when you're climbing. Mm -hmm.